they basically raised this little boy and they were facing the fact that now this boy is going to be taken by the father because he's the rightful father of the child. And another stress. And what happens? The father says, I can't do it. And so they have been raising this grandson of theirs and they are so overjoyed with the bundle of joy that is in their life. And every time they see him, they see her face and they understand every day more and more God's working in their life and why Amanda was taken from him. But that's the way the Lord works. And the Lord is saying, just stand back and let me do it and I will handle it for you. Okay? And that is what he's telling these people. I will deliver you. I've promised I will. I will. Go ahead. I have to say it again. Okay. Stand still. Yes. And see the salvation of the Lord. Don't even move. I'm going to do everything in your life to deliver you. Despite, you know, Roy, I won't say what happened unless he wants to tell you, but he had a medical procedure recently. Okay? And the Lord is using that for his glory if Roy is going to allow him to. And the same thing with each one of us. I got pains in my back. Every time I get out of this dumb chair and I keep saying I'm going to bring a cushion and I keep forgetting because it's hard. But you know what, there is a purpose for this. And I just have to accept that having a back that causes me problems keeps me from doing something worse. Whatever, everything that happens in our life, if we believe Romans 8.28, is being worked out for His glory. Let me read that to you just so you remember because it ties in perfectly with this verse. Romans 8.28, everything, everything, if you can believe God's Word. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. That means if you have called on the name of Jesus Christ, you are the called. That doesn't apply to anybody else on earth until they say, I want to know this God that sent His Son to die for me. And once you have done that, every single thing that happens in your life, everything from that point on is being worked out for God's glory and for your good, including Amanda's death, including my pain in the back, including your procedure. Every single thing that we do in our life is being brought out for His glory, whether we know it or not, whether we can see it right now or not. And that's hard when we have loved ones that we're facing trouble with. That's hard when we have uh, trials, when we have temptations and all these things in our life. But He's made that promise. And that, that is what God is asking is have faith. Don't be like the Egyptian, I'm the Israelite standing there at the, the, the sea. Have faith, and it will work out. I, man, I just love the fact that God has promised that because I don't always see it, and I want to. Okay, go ahead, 14. Well, I didn't do it. Oh, okay, go ahead. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Can you imagine? They're standing at the sea. They're right there. They're camped there at the sea. They've probably got another 150 feet of shore left. And after that, it's into the water. Tell them to go forward. Just so you know, in verse 14, when it says, hold your peace, the word in Hebrew is be quiet. Tell them to just be quiet. I'm going to do everything. So here he says something that must have just, they, they must have just gone, what do you mean go forward? Where are we going to go? We've got gorgeous here, we've got them behind us, and all we've got is a few more feet of beach. But, go ahead. But, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, indeed, will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army his chariots and his horsemen. Okay, you know what? And Pharaoh, I, I got to tell you, I think this through, he must have really been, he must have really been, uh, 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 I, I can't imagine. Okay. The, yeah, what you we're going to see, the description of what it looks like, and he thinks, oh, I'm just going to go through and follow him. And he already knows that this is, uh, it's coming. We'll get to it in a couple more verses here, but unbelievable. Okay, my 17 now? Uh, 18. 18. Okay. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Okay, they're going to know. As I said, and Ezekiel says this many times. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Well, when they're all dead. I mean, they've, if some people, it takes dying to know that they were wrong. And some people, you know, the thief on the cross next to Jesus, he found out a few minutes before he died. Fortunately for him, 
He was, he, and if you read the account in Matthew, he was belittling Jesus. And in the account in Luke, something happened during his time on the cross that made him realize, I have been wrong about this guy. And that's how merciful God is. All it takes is... And what is it? The first person to die in human history to go to be with the Lord was a criminal. That, that is the infinite grace and mercy of God. The very first person ever to die after Jesus Christ was a criminal. Unbelievable. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Uh, go ahead. And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of clouds went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It's simply amazing. You know, he just, he's not only there... He, and as I said, they had a little bit of space before they got to the sea because the angel is there. But now the angel moves behind them to obscure the... I, the whole thing just smacks of, of an amazing... I, I, I wish I could have been there to see this, you know. I, I wish I could have been there to actually witness this going on. How God is doing... Just tell them to be quiet. I'm going to do everything for these people. Okay, go ahead and keep reading. So, it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus, it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other. Unbelievable. So that the one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. Okay, right there, it describes exactly how God did it. All right, so the question is, in the very first sermon I ever did here at Grace Baptist, what did I say? What happens when we get a cold front here in Sarasota in the wintertime? What happens to the bay out back of my house? Empty. It's empty. You could walk across the bay if it weren't for the uh, intercoastal waterway. You could walk right across the bay. Is that a miracle that that happens? No, it's no miracle at all. God describes what he did in order to get the Red Sea open. He had an east wind blow all that night. What is the miracle then in this context? It happened. it happened exactly at the right time when there are all of these people needing deliverance. If I went out there in the middle of the summertime and I said, part for me, it wouldn't happen. It, w it, it wouldn't happen in a million years with me out there demanding that it happens. I can raise a staff and I can hoot and holler and I can do every other thing and it is not going to happen. And suppose a bunch of terrorists come on to Siesta Key and start shooting everybody and my wife and my family are standing at the end of the dock saying, open, is it going to happen? No. The miracle is that God says, this is going to happen and it happens. It doesn't matter how he did it. To me, it's irrelevant how he did it. But he does tell us in this case. The fact that God delivers his people always at the right time, just like the Jewish people, three wars in a row, they are delivered because he said, I will, Amos 9, 14 and 15, we've read it in every class for the past uh, month or two, and what does it say? It says, I will plant my people Israel back in the land of Israel, and they will never be uprooted again. And what have I said about those two verses? If they don't come true, if, they, if Israel is taken out of the land, what can you do with your Bible? Throw it away. Throw it away. I guarantee you that this word will stand when every nation that comes against Israel falls. This will never be violated, ever. He said that they are back in the land, and I, just as you said, Gene, I'm not going to fight against God. I don't like what the Jewish people do. I see how they treat Jesus Christ, I see how they, they have homosexual things over in Tel Aviv and they've got, you know, all the things that they do. This is God's sovereign choice. He has said, these are my people and they will eventually call on my name and I'm doing this for my purpose. I will not, I will not fight against God. And Israel, despite how I feel about some of the actions and some of the things they do, I will never fail to support them as a people because God has decided this. I will never fight against God, ever in this particular case. And he has said that in his word, and I am as sure, I am as absolutely sure that that is going to happen, that they will be in this land as anything, I'm as sure as I'm sitting in this chair right now. So, please, go ahead. So, the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. 
and the Egyptians pursued them and went after them into the midst of the sea, oh. with Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. Okay, so probably what's happening here, and it doesn't say this specifically, I'm just giving you kind of a, uh, uh, a, a, a scenario. The wheels are coming off. Why would that be? What do you think is happening? Stuck in the mud. They're, it, it, the waters are starting to come back. Maybe he's lessening the wind a little bit or whatever. There's a wall on this side and a wall on this side, and that is not something that we can even debate. It's very clear in here that there was a wall of water on either side. And probably the winds are debating or abating to the point where the water is starting to fill up the area and so the chariot wheels are coming off. Now it doesn't say that but I'm just speculating that that is how he is doing this. He took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And yeah, if you've ever seen a chariot with Ben-Hur, perfect example. Boy, you get those chariot wheels off or even a little bit off and they are the what? You're in big trouble with them. That's right. So, um, okay, go ahead. They drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots, and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth. Unbelievable. Just, you know. The Egyptians were fleeing into it. Mm -hmm. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Okay, now while we are, I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. While we've just read that, I was looking for it while you were talking, and so I didn't, I didn't mean to make a lot of noise here. But this goes to a... Paul is going to make a theological point about what we've just been reading. 1 Corinthians 12, it says, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit and, you know, the Spirit of the Lord and all this. And he says, um, where is, I want to, I should have looked at the exact verse, but um, um, is it 1 Corinthians 12? I'm sure that's what I wanted. Uh, we use those spiritual gifts? Yeah, oh. No, that's not what I was looking for. For one spirit, we were all baptized. I'm looking for, if you have the word baptized in a concordance, like I've got it here if you don't. That's not the one. It says, I want you brothers not to be unaware that all were baptized in the, uh, 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 that's not the verse I want. I went to my concordance, which is a very small one here. And uh, hang on one sec. It is in, it's either in one or two Corinthians. I don't know which one. Give me one second here. If you find it. I, he's making a spiritual point about the account we just read. And it's funny because I don't know why I can't remember this because I quote it all the time, but I'm having just a, a, a mind dump right now. Baptize, B-A-P. Come on, Charlie. I'm in B-E. you got to get all the way back to B-A, B-A-R, B-A-C. All right, I'm right on the right page here. Baptize, okay, and it would be in, it's either one or two Corinthians baptized. Um... 1 Corinthians, your baby pond. There's a bunch of them. One seven. Okay, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, not 12. Thank okay, you. that's what we want. Thank you. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. He says, um, Now the Lord said to Moses, uh, Oh, I'm in Exodus again. Doggone it, I'm sorry. I, yeah, if you, if you get there, go ahead and just read it. 1 Corinthians 10. Just start with verse 1. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Okay, so what he's saying here is that he's making a spiritual application about us. Brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers are uh, under the cloud and all passed through the sea. The cloud is what's moving around them, remember? The cloud. And then they're in the sea. Are you okay, Roy? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Um, uh, I need a can if I was fine. <laughs> they're all, and they passed through the sea. So the Egyptians are going through the sea, okay, and he's making a point about this. Go ahead in verse 3. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. Which we're going to get to in another few verses, all right? Maybe, I, I don't know when, maybe today, maybe not, but go ahead. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. So he's saying that everything that we have been reading here, 
Everything that we have been reading in this passage, all is Jesus. 